begin with the words of the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, not Christian, writing in the first century. Do you want to know yourself? Consult your dreams. Now, in dream work during the last 150 years, a great emphasis has been placed on the unconscious. As Jung says, the dream is specifically the utterance of the unconscious. Just as the psyche has a diurnal side, which we call consciousness, so also it has a nocturnal side, the unconscious psychic activity, which we apprehend as dream-like fantasies. And Jung likewise asserts, dreaming has a meaning like everything else we do. Every dream is an organ of information and control, and dreams are our most effective aid in building up our personality. Now, let us start then by asking, is there an equivalent in early Christian writing for the concept of the unconscious. If we are interpreting the question strictly, the answer is no. The modern notion of the unconscious is specifically the fruit of developments in Western European thinking since the late 17th century and it has no exact parallel in the ancient world. Yet, if we look more deeply, we might be inclined to answer yes. We should avoid the temptation to reify the unconscious, to treat it as a kind of distinct object or thing. As Jung himself said, the concept of the unconscious posits nothing. It designates only my unknowing. The notion of the unconscious understood in this sense is a way of saying that my total self is not to be identified with my conscious awareness of myself at a given moment. Now, if that is what the unconscious means, then the Greek fathers agree with modern psychology. For it is a recurrent theme in early Christian writers that we are a mystery to ourselves. Gregory of Nyssa, for example, asks, has anyone ever understood his own intellect? The word he uses there is nous. And he answers, no. We do not fully understand ourselves. He goes on to give a specific reason for this. The human person is made in the image and likeness of God. God is beyond our understanding. What is true of the archetype is true also of the image. Therefore, the human person, made in God's image, made in the image of the unknowable deity, is also beyond our understanding. And St. Basil says exactly the same. We do not understand our own essence. Consider equally what is said about the heart 
in the Macarian homilies, which date from the late 4th century. The homilies attributed to St. Macarius of Egypt, but probably they are Syriac in background. We are told there, in the heart are unfathomable depths. The heart is but a small vessel, and yet dragons and lions are there, and there are poisonous creatures, and all the treasures of wickedness. Rough, uneven paths are there, and gaping chasms. There, likewise, in the heart is God. There are the angels. There, life and the kingdom. There, light and the apostles, the heavenly cities, and the treasures of grace. All things are there. Evidently, the heart, on the Macarian understanding, is far more inclusive than mere ego consciousness. It includes unfathomable depths. Surely that must mean the unconscious. Rough, uneven paths are there, gaping chasms. The heart is open below to the abyss of the unconscious. The heavenly cities and the treasures of grace are there. It is open above to the abyss of divine grace. If there is in this way a partial patristic parallel to the modern concept of the unconscious, how far do the fathers anticipate modern views on the interpretation of dreams? Here we might start by looking at Homer who says in the Odyssey that dreams are of two types and he speaks of two gates of ivory and of horn. Friend, many and many a dream is mere confusion, a cobweb of no consequence at all. Two gates for ghostly dreams there are. One gateway of honest horn and one of ivory. Issuing by the ivory gate are dreams of glimmering illusions, fantasies. But those that come through solid polished horn may be borne out if mortals only know how to do this. So there, Homer makes a clear distinction between dreams of two types, the illusory dreams and those which, if properly interpreted, are true. Now, when we turn to the Bible, we find that on one side there is a positive interpretation of dreams. They may come from God and they may indeed predict the future. Take as a typical example of that Job chapter 33 verses 15 to 16. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon humans, while they slumber on their bed, then God opens their ears and terrifies them with warnings. You notice there that dream and vision are not clearly distinguished. And in many cases in the Bible, where there is a reference to dreams, 
it isn't clear always whether this is actually a dream in the sleep or whether it's a waking vision. So dreams can be a way in which God speaks to us. But there is also a sceptical view of dreams that we would find in Ecclesiasticus, or the book also known as Sirach, um, chapter 34, 1 to 8, for example, would be a classic passage there. Um, dreams give wings to fools. As one who catches at a shadow and pursues the wind, so is he who gives heed to dreams. Yet, even in this passage of Ecclesiasticus, the possibility is accepted that dreams may come from God. So then, ambivalence here. Dreams may be simply nonsensical, but they may have a meaning. And we have in the Old Testament a number of notable occasions um, where dreams play an important part. Jacob's ladder, Genesis 28. The story of Joseph in Genesis 37 and 40 to 41. Joseph dreams of the sheaves, of the sun and moon. He interprets correctly the dreams of Pharaoh's butler and baker and of Pharaoh himself. And another important place for dreams is in the book of Daniel, <coughs> when Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. So basing yourself on the Bible, you cannot simply dismiss dreams as meaningless. In the New Testament, the role of dreams is rather limited. The most of the stories concerning dreams um, come in the nativity narratives in the Gospel of Matthew. Joseph is told of the virgin birth in a dream. Matthew 1, 20. He's told in a dream to flee to Egypt. The wise men are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Later on, um, Joseph is told that he may return from Egypt. Uh, he's told in a dream not to go back, however, to uh, Bethlehem, but to, he goes to Nazareth. And in these accounts of dreams, it is said that the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph and the others in a dream. So there we see the role of angels in dreams. Dreams do not perhaps come directly from God, but they are communicated to us by the angels. Uh, outside the first two chapters of Matthew, there aren't many other references to dreams. Um, there is one later in Matthew where uh, the wife of Pontius Pilate sends him a message, have nothing to do with it, this just man, for I have suffered many things this night in a dream. So she tries to dissuade Pontius Pilate. And later on in Acts 16.9, a man of Macedonia appears in a dream to St. Paul <coughs> and says, come over into Macedonia and help us. It is interesting that in the Old Testament, dreams are symbolical and have to be interpreted. But in the New Testament, the message given by dreams does not seem to be symbolical, it is direct and explicit. In the Jewish Talmud, 
it is said that dreams <coughs> constitute one sixtieth part of prophecy. So that means they're not terribly important. But in the Talmud, the daily prayers used by Jews, there is a prayer for good dreams. And I think that might be useful to circulate among Christians as well. <laughs> That, of course, is an interesting question. Why uh, do apparently good people often have very bad dreams? Why do we sometimes do things in our dreams that we would never think of doing in our waking life? The modern psychoanalysts will say, compensation. <laughs> you are suppressing the shadow side in yourself. You refuse to acknowledge that you're not actually quite such a nice person as you think you are. The ancient world and the Greek fathers would have had a different explanation. They would say that these shocking dreams that very virtuous people have are, in fact, from the demons. And that gives us another possibility. Basically, in the early Christian interpretation of dreams, you have three possibilities. Dreams may be good, and they may come from the angels. Dreams may be bad, and they come from the demons. I don't think in the New Testament there's any instance of a dream coming from demonic powers. Or thirdly, dreams may simply be nonsensical and may have no significance at all. A writer who attaches particular importance to this third possibility is Gregory of Nyssa in his work on the creation of the human person. Dreams, he says, are full of fantastic nonsense, of absurd and impossible situations. And he excludes the notion that dreams might accurately predict the future. In sleep, he says, the highest part of the soul, the intellect or noose, is inactive. So those of you who are sleeping at this particular moment, <laughs> not listening to me, uh, that means your intellect is not at work. <laughs> the nutritive part of the soul, the lower part, takes over. And what happens in our dreams, says Gregory, is that they awaken echoes of what happened in our waking moments. So dreams are a confused replay of what has happened to us mainly in the previous day. Some time ago, uh, uh, a writer, J.W. Dunne, D-U-N-N-E, wrote a book about dreams in which he all argued that dreams, in fact, may predict what's going to happen to us not in the past day, but in the coming day. So um, he thought that in dreaming we move into a different level of time and therefore might indeed experience the future. But Gregory of Nyssa is not having any of that. He emphasizes how our bodily condition affects our dreams. Dreams have a physical origin. If you're thirsty, then in the dream you'll th dream about rivers and springs. Um, when I was a child, I was told not to eat cheese before I went to bed, because it would give me dreams. Presumably it would give me indigestion. But as I liked having dreams, I always ate lots of cheese. <laughs> 
Gregory, in this way, downplays the numinous quality of dreams, but he also accepts the possibility, which he could hardly deny in view of the evidence in Scripture, that God may indeed speak to us through dreams. It is significant that dreams often had a decisive influence on the life of early Christians. For example, the shepherd of Hermas, second century, that recounts a number of decisive dreams in the life of Hermas. The martyrdom of St. Perpetua, early 3rd century, she has an important dream before her martyrdom. You all know how Augustine, in the course of his conversion, was uh, influenced by a dream that his mother Monica had. Um, Gregory Nazi answers was inspired by dreams to dedicate himself to a life of celibacy. So you've got just a few examples out of many of early Christians whose lives were decisively influenced by having dreams. In the monastery to which I belong, the monastery of St. John the Theologian in Patmos, out of a community of about 20, I am aware of at least three persons who were influenced to adopt the monastic life by dreams. And there may be more than that because dreams are very private and personal and we don't always tell other people about the dreams we've had. So dreams can have a big influence on your life. This is accepted certainly by early Christians. By the way, if you want a useful book on dreams among the early Christians, read Patricia Cox Miller. Dreams in Late Antiquity published in 1994. Now, I would like to look at an author not discussed by Cox Miller, and this is Evagrius of Pontus. He lives in the second half of the fourth century, He died probably in 399. He was in his youth a disciple of the Cappadocian fathers, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus in particular, Basil also, and through them he was much influenced by Origen. And then in his later life he moved to the Egyptian desert, where he lived a life of considerable austerity. Uh, before he died, he said that for 12 years he had not eaten any meat or green vegetables, nor touched a bark. <laughs> now, Evagrius's own life was decisively influenced by a dream, and let me tell you um, about that. He recounted this to one of his disciples, Pelagius. Uh, Evagrius, as a deacon, went with Gregory of Nazianzus to Constantinople for the Second Ecumenical Council in the year 381. And there he became entangled in an affair with a married woman of noble birth. And he had a dream. 
He dreamt that he was imprisoned somewhere, and somebody came into the prison, and Agrius himself in the dream was in a state of profound anxiety. And a friend came in and said, uh, Deacon, what are you doing here? And Evagrius says in the dream, I'd love to get out of here. All right, says the friend. Wait a moment. He goes off and he brings back a book of the Gospels. Swear, he says, on the book of the Gospels that you will leave the city of Constantinople immediately. Evagrius swears. Then he wakes up. His first inclination is to say, it was only a dream. But then he says, I did swear on the book of the Gospels. So I am bound by what happened. Therefore, he leaves on the very same day from Constantinople without saying goodbye to his lady friend. And he takes a boat to the Holy Land. And he settles for the time being on the Mount of Olives, uh, where, I forget who it is, Melania, I think one of the Melanias is the abbess. And while he is on the Mount of Olives, he is ill much of the time. And one day the abbess summons him and says, Deacon, I don't like your illness. Um, there's something wrong here. There must be some spiritual cause for it. So Evagrius tells her about why he left Constantinople. Very well, she said, um, you must go to Egypt, you must go to the desert and spend the rest of your time as an ascetic there. Interesting example of a woman acting as spiritual guide. And Evagrius obeys and goes off for the rest of his life to the desert. Now, Evagrius is probably of all patristic writers the one who enters most deeply into the interpretation of dreams. Before Freud, perhaps no one had as much to say about the subject as he does. Though he's drawing on classical authors like Aristotle and the Stoics. He isn't interested in the secondary symbolism of dreams. There were dream books in the ancient world as today, explaining dreams often with a rather arbitrary symbolism. For example, uh, Astrampsicus of the fourth century um, has a dream book to wear a purple robe threatens a long disease. To see white meats is exceedingly advantageous. But to see dark meats forebodes evil to your children. Yeah. To dream of eating eggs symbolizes vexation. Uh, the eating of figs signifies nonsensical discourse. The sight of a hare uh, portends an unlucky journey. Well, you're familiar enough of modern dream books which are full of this arbitrary symbolism. And Evagrius will have nothing of this. Um, he doesn't, on the whole, see dreams as predictive, not in a direct way. Dreams, he says, reveal to us our present state. What happens in dreams is that things that we are hiding from ourselves may come to the surface. What in our conscious life we are repressing will in our dream life be revealed. <clears throat> so dreams in this way can perform a predictive function but not in the arbitrary manner of the dream books. The future is revealed through the present. Dreams are simply an indication of our spiritual state. He doesn't think they have, 
healing power. But Evagoras is very interested in the affective content of the dream. How did we feel about the dream at the time and afterwards? Were we pleased with the dream or distressed? This for him is important. So he says, there are many passions hidden in our souls whose causes escape us. The noose, the intellect fighting against the passion is like someone engaged in a battle by night who doesn't understand the reasons for the conflict. Now, Evagrius distinguishes three types of dreams, such as we've already indicated. They may come from demons. And he's got a lot to say about the activity of the demons in the dreams. Secondly, they may come from angels. He's quite definite that dreams are not due to the direct action of God, but they may be angelic. And then, in the third place, dreams may be neutral, without demonic or angelic intervention. The soul may just recall in sleep what it's done while waking. That's the position, of, as we saw, of Gregory of Nyssa. Now, he's not very interested in the third type of dream. He concentrates on the first two. Unlike Gregory of Nyssa, he doesn't stress the physical origin of dreams, eating cheese or the like. Um, he says it's often extremely difficult to judge whether a dream is uh, from demonic or angelic source. We need to have caution. We need to have diacrisis, discernment. Um, we've got to be cautious, but we shouldn't altogether reject dreams. They may be performing a good function. Now, he mentions various types of dreams inspired by demons. Um, first of all, terrifying nightmares are usually from the demons. They would be designed to trouble hermits, for example, and to discourage them from continuing in the monastic life. But, he says, sometimes angels may send us terrifying dreams for our benefit. Then again, uh, the demons will show us dreams in which we see our loved ones in distress or dead. It would be natural among the monks for whom Evagrius was writing that they might feel nostalgia for their home and wonder how their relatives were getting on. So the demons will hinge onto this and give you dreams which distress you about what's happening to those whom you've left behind. And then again, dreams of pride may come from the demons. Dreams where we perform acts of healing, where we defeat the demons, where we're praised by other people. I don't think Evagra specifically mentions a thing which often we like to imagine and might come into our dreams, which is that at our funeral all kinds of people come and they're all weeping and very distressed. But if you have a dream like that, it's almost certainly from the demon. <laughs> encouraging you to think too highly of yourself. And, of course, uh, erotic dreams come from the demons. But those are not the only dreams that he's interested in. And the demons may even appear in our dreams in the form of angels. See 2 Corinthians 
4.11. Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. Of course, 11.14. I don't think Evagrius mentions the test of getting uh, the figure that appears in the dreams to make the sign of the cross, which, as I said this morning, is a good way of knowing whether this is an angel or a demon. Now, he thinks that dreams can certainly help us, and here there is an overlap with modern psychoanalysis in our spiritual self-knowledge. Different passions provoke specific kinds of dreams within us, so by scrutinizing our dreams, we can discover what passions are lie hidden deep in our souls. And our reactions uh, in the course of our dreams reflect our deep dispositions. So through dreams, the unconscious is brought to the surface and can be analyzed. And here Evagoras is following the Stoics, following Epictetus, for example. But his actual interpretation of dream symbolism is relatively straightforward and lacking, by our standards, in subtlety. Here is one example he gives. Among dreams that he is a shepherd looking after a flock. He wakes up, and by an obvious connection of ideas, he begins to think of ordination to the priesthood. So dreams reveal hidden passion, in this case, of pride. They bring out what we are suppressing. That's Evagrius' position. And Evagrius doesn't imagine that in any simplified or naive fashion we can regulate our dreams. In modern psychology, it is emphasized that the content of our dreams is highly unpredictable. But he does believe that at a certain point in spiritual development, we can control our response in dreams. Not necessarily control the content of our dreams, but control the way in which, during our dream itself, we react against it. He accepts that morally good people, as I've mentioned, may often have highly immoral dreams, but where Jung would have explained this by compensation. He explains it by the demons. It is the demons. But at a more advanced stage of spiritual development, he says, although the demons may still provoke evil images within our dreams, we won't react to them. The demons may suggest extremely lively erotic images in the dream, but, at a certain stage in our spiritual development, we shall not be aroused, but we will merely detach ourselves from it. Though tempted, we shall have no reaction. So the criterion here is not so much what images occur to us in our dreams, but how in the course of our dreams, not afterwards when we wake up, but while we're still asleep, we react to the images. And if we don't react, this means that we are approaching the state of dispassion or apathia, which is what we're aiming at. Freedom from the past. It is a proof, he says, of apathia when the intellect begins to see its own light and when it remains tranquil in the presence of images 
occurring in sleep. Conversely, if we fail to remain tranquil before the image is occurring in sleep, this shows that our passions are less under control than perhaps in our waking moments we imagine. So if Agnes doesn't consider that dreams can be directly manipulated, but he does consider that grace attained in our <coughs> conscious life gradually penetrates the unconscious and transfigures it, and this becomes apparent in our dreams. Now, in all of this, we can see obvious parallels in modern depth psychology, though there's nothing comparable in the ancient world to the detailed dream analysis that we've got in Freud and Jung. But the fathers do accept that dreams can help us in the task of self-discovery, can bring to light unconscious aspects of ourselves, and that, yes, dreams can therefore help us on the path of self-knowledge. But the predominant approach of the fathers to dreams is one of suspicion. Typical example. One of the two old men of Gaza, Barsanufis the Great, early 6th century, is asked, should I trust a dream if it comes to me three times in succession? And Barsanufis answers bluntly, no, you should not. So caution towards the dreams is urged throughout the patristic text. I've said there are parallels in the Fathers to the modern idea of the unconscious and to the modern approach to dreams as helping us in self-analysis. But I should note in conclusion that in people like Evagrius and others, there's no parallel to Jung's theory of the collective unconscious. That doesn't come in the Fathers. And you don't have Jung's idea of archetypes appearing in the fathers either. So the parallels are by no means exact. Thank you.